Hi guys, welcome back. I'm Craig and I'm a software developer in the UK and in this video we're going to continue looking at forms in HTML. Forms bring us lots of interactive elements that we typically find on most modern web pages and these interactive elements include password fields, checkboxes, buttons that we can click and drop down menus that allow us to choose from a series of options. In the last video, we looked at the input element and its type attributes and we specifically focused on textual inputs like type equals text, type equals email and type equals password. And we also looked at the label element and the text area element. There's lots of other input types that do things differently to the ones that we've seen. And in this video, we're going to focus on these. These are what I would call clickable input elements. They're still inputs with type attributes, but our users will be interacting with these by clicking on them. I have my code in exactly the same state as where I left it in the last video. So if you need to grab a copy of that code, there's a link to it in the description below where you can download it to your machine or alternatively, you can just go to CodePen and work in this pen. You don't need an account to work with this pen and update it, but you will need an account if you want to save your work. That wouldn't be the worst thing in the world as CodePen is a really great little tool and it's brought to you by the same people behind CSS Tricks. Okay, so let's crack on. Other types of input beside the textual types that we've discussed include checkboxes, radio buttons, drop down menus and submit buttons and these are all important features of any form on the web. You might see checkboxes in a login form to check an option if you want to stay logged in for example and for that we would use type equals checkbox. So first I'm going to add a horizontal rule to separate what we're doing in this video with the content of the last video and we do that with the HR tag and you see that it just pops a line across the full width of the page. So for our checkbox we're going to need a comment to help us out and I'll also put in an input element. Also we're going to need a label element. So I'll add multiple cursors in the for attribute type and the ID and also in the empty comment. I'll type checkbox and hit save and you see that we have this familiar checkbox that we can check and uncheck. By default, the checkbox is unchecked, but we might want ours to be checked to begin with, and we simply do this by adding the word checked to the input tag. No need to add anything else, so we'll save and refresh, and you see that our checkbox is always checked. We can add as many checkboxes as we like, and we can check as many or as few of them as we like. We could have, say, three checkboxes, for example, where we could be asking on a hotel booking form if guests wanted to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they could check all three, none of those, or just one or two of those options. There's plenty of cool stuff that you can do with checkboxes that we'll look at later on when we're doing CSS, including something called the checkbox hack which is where you could use a checkbox to control some other element. I have an example here, and this is where a checkbox is being used to toggle a menu. And this is just a normal checkbox whose appearance has been altered in CSS. So when the checkbox is checked, it shows a navigation menu. And if it is unchecked, we have the menu hidden. I'll show you exactly how you do this in the CSS section of videos. If you want to read a little bit more about this, you can head over to the link in the description at CSS Tricks to read more about the checkbox hack. Okay, so after that little aside, let's head back to our form and our input elements, and you can also add a date, like a date to book a ticket for something. For this, we use a type of date. So again, I'll paste in what we've copied, and inside the comment, the for attribute, the type and ID, I'll just add date. Now, when you save, you see that we have this date input and the date input enables the user to enter a date either using this text box or a drop down menu, which is a date picker interface. The format here is the UK format where we have the day, the month, and then the year. And this may differ for you. I know that in the US, for example, they have the formats slightly differently with the month preceding the day and the year. So like date, we can also have time and I'll duplicate the date input and I'll just change the relevant details to time. If we save, we now give users the ability to enter a time if we needed to for any reason, say booking an appointment or booking a table or a restaurant or booking a train journey or a coach journey or something like that. 
Next, we'll have a look at color, which again gives us another user interface. And color allows us to specify color in a number of ways. We can use one of the numerous visual color picker interfaces available to select a predefined color or we can enter the color into a text input field here in hexadecimal format. It comes with this eyedropper, which we can hover over anything on the screen and get the hexadecimal color code or the RGB code. We can also have a type of file in which we have the option to upload a file. For example, on social media platforms, we could use this functionality to upload an image or a video file. I have the Google logo on my desktop, so I'll just select that, click open, and that's it. So what we're seeing here is that these are all exactly the same HTML element, an input element, and we're getting a huge amount of variation. The only thing that really changes, which produces this variation, is the type attribute. So if we have a type equals checkbox, you get a checkbox. If it's file, you get a form input through which you can upload a file. I'll give you guys a link in the description below to W3Schools, which covers all of the available input types. And that is much more than we can cover in this series of videos. Some have only been added since HTML5 became standard. And of those, we have seen email, date, time, and color. So this is a really good resource and it's down below in the description for you guys. The next input type is the radio button and a radio input is similar to a checkbox except that when presented with more than one option you can only select one at a time. So in a series of checkboxes you could check as many as you like and in a series of radio buttons you can only choose one option. They're called radio buttons because they look and operate in a similar manner to the push buttons on old fashioned car radios like this one where only one button can be pressed at a time. So you press a button and whichever was previously selected would just pop out. The radio buttons in HTML work in a similar format and they allow the user to choose one of a predefined set of options. So we'll add two radio buttons, one that says yes, the other that says no, and we're giving our user a choice. We'll build out the radio button for yes, and then we'll duplicate it to replace the relevant details with no rather than yes. So if I add an input type of radio using an Emmet shortcut, we can say input colon R and hit tab, and then we have the radio input built for us. We see it already has a type of radio and an empty ID and a new attribute called name, which we will come to in a second. I'll give it a label, and we know that the for and the ID need to match, so I'll select both and fill them out at the same time. This time, in the label, I'm going to add some text between the opening and closing tags, as this will help the user on the page understand what each radio button is for. So we have our yes button. I'll duplicate that by highlighting it and hitting Command, Shift and D and I'll change Radio Yes in the For and ID to Radio No and in the text content in the label to No. So now if we save, you'll see that we have two selectable radio buttons on our page, one for Yes and one for No. At present we can select both, which isn't what we want. We want these to operate as we would expect radio buttons to operate. You select one which automatically deselects the other. The reason our radio buttons aren't behaving as we want just yet is because they are not linked. Our code does not know that we want them to operate together in a set and this is exactly what the name attribute is for. We would link two radio buttons by giving them both a common and shared name attribute and in this case we'll just say something like choose. Okay so if we save that and have a click on both buttons, you can see now that as soon as we've changed that name attribute, the two radio buttons are linked programmatically and we can only select one or the other. We could have 10 or 100 or 1000 radio buttons linked with the same name and you would only ever be able to select just one. To demonstrate this, I'll duplicate again and I'll add a choice for maybe. So I'll duplicate the no button and label and I'll change the for and ID to radio maybe. I'll leave the name attribute as it is, as we want that linked to the two existing buttons, and we'll change the label text to maybe. Now, if we save, we have three radio buttons and we can select just one option. You can have as many groups of radio buttons on a page as you want, as long as each group has its own name, and we have this named as choose. We might have another asking people their preferred method of contact, say phone, email, or post, or we could have another group of radio buttons asking somebody if they are over or under 18, and so on. 
Radio buttons can also have a value attribute which are individual to the button. The attribute gives us the ability to know which button was selected when the form is submitted. So to our buttons we might add values of yes, no and maybe. The value attribute can be added to other input elements as well, not just to radio buttons. So if we go to this page at W3Scores, we see that for text-based input elements, it defines the initial value that's set in the text field. For buttons and submit inputs, which we will come to shortly, it defines the text that's on the button. Click me, for example. And on radio buttons and on checkboxes, it defines the value associated with the input. And this is also the value that is sent when the form is submitted. Okay, so we'll move on. And the next form element that we're going to look at is the drop down menu. And this works a little differently to the others in that they are not input elements, but rather are select elements. The select element is still going to be nested inside the form element, just like the other elements that we've seen. And we use select, opening, and closing tags. And within these, we would nest option tags, which specify an option in the drop down menu. So they are constructed in a similar manner to lists. We'll have another HR, horizontal rule element, to provide some separation. And then we'll add the select tags using Emmet. It builds out the select element for us with a name and an ID, and I'll put both of these as select. In between the select tags, we'll create some space and we'll add in three sets of option tags. Rather than writing this manually, I'll use Emmet again, and I'll type option multiplied by three. And we get our three sets of option tags inside our selected element. The option tag simply defines an option in a select list and Emmet has built it for us with this value attribute which indicates what is going to be sent to the server. Here we will ask our user for their favourite colour and we will have red, blue and green. So first we'll add a label for select and some text in the label of select your favourite colour so that everything is all together. I'll include a div element and I'll put our select and label tags inside of that. We haven't seen the div element in detail just yet, but just so you know, the div element acts as a division or a section of a page, and I'm using it to keep our label and select element together in this instance. Now, in the option tags that we've created, we have to have a value and some text that will be on the page. So all we do in each option is to create a multiple selection in the value attribute between the options opening and closing tags. So we'll have red for the first option, blue for the second option, and the third option is going to be green. So if we save and refresh, we have a nice drop-down menu where our user can choose which one they prefer of the available choices presented to them. When we make a select list, we have a default choice, which is always whatever the first option tag is. Our list always shows the first option selected by default, but what if we wanted to override that and have one of the other options selected by default? Well, this is easily achieved by adding the word selected to another option. I'll add it to the third option, which is green and save, and now when we refresh, we see that green is always the default option as opposed to red. So we have a fairly sizable form with lots of different elements here, much more than we would need in a real world form, but we do see that we have lots of options. Styling and layout is an issue, of course, but that's something that we're going to address in the CSS section of the course. But we interact with all of these elements and we can ask users to enter a username, an email, a password and add a comment. We can check our checkbox and add dates and times and we have a group of working radio buttons and we can also select options from a drop down. We now come to the last input type that we'll look at for now and that is the submit input type. Input elements of type submit are rendered as buttons and when the click event occurs, typically this is because the user has clicked a button, the user agent attempts to submit the form to the server. So we'll add another HR, horizontal rule element, and provide some separation. And for the submit button, we're again going to use the input tag and use the type attribute, which will equal submit. So if we put one of those in using the image shortcut of input colon submit, we'll see it's just an input element and it has a value attribute also, which comes with it when we build it with Emmet, which is going to be the text on the button itself. So I'll put that text as click me. And if we were going to leave this blank and not specify the value, then by default, the text on the button would say submit. So if we save, we see that we have a nice submit button that our users can click when they are ready to submit the form. 
when I fill in all input fields and click submit, it doesn't go anywhere at present as there's no backend currently connected. So our form is currently just presentational, but it is doing something. At the moment, it is returning an HTTP 405 error when I click this button. The 405 error is happening because our form tag has a post method and we're trying to post the data to a location that we can't post to. That location is defined by the action attribute and at the moment it's empty. So the data has nowhere to go. If we put say HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.bbc.co.uk, the BBC will also give us a 405. And if we change that to google.com from bbc.co.uk, we'll also get a 405 from Google. And that's because we do not have permission to send our data to these places or these places are not set up to receive data. So the easiest thing for us to do, as we do not currently have anywhere for our data to go, is just to remove the action and method attributes from the opening and closing tags. Now, when we press submit, we may not be submitting to the back end yet, but if you watch the refresh arrow, it activates very quickly. So pressing the button presently without those attributes refreshes the page and removes all of the input data, which is essentially the function that it would normally produce, i.e. returning the form to its blank state and moving the data out of the front end. So if I don't specify an action, the form will just go to where we currently are. Another type of button that we can use is the reset button. And we would simply use this to reset or clear any information that has been entered into a form. And for that, we use input type reset. So if we use the Emmet shortcut of input colon reset, we get a type of reset and a value attribute that's blank. So like with submit, this controls the text that will be on the button. And for that, I'll just add reset. So if we enter some random things into our form, so something in the username and some other bits dotted about. Then when we hit the reset button, it will just clear the form. W3 scores say to avoid reset buttons in your forms as they can be frustrating for users if they click them by mistake, but you know, you can make your own mind up about that. Okay, so this is a good place to stop guys. Our forms now have all of these constituent parts which are made up of textual inputs like inputs with type text, email and password, as well as the text area elements. We have clickable elements like checkboxes, radio button groups, drop down menus, and finally we have an input of type submit which will submit our forms to the back end when we have one available. I know this form is incredibly unattractive at the moment. It's not the prettiest at all by any stretch of the imagination, but this is just markup and I'm showing you how to display these input fields for now. When we get to the CSS section, I'll show you how to style forms and we'll do a sizable project on styling the holiday form that we're going to be building in the very next video. So in that next video, I'll show you some simple client side form validations. And these validations are all about applying some set of rules to parts of the form that we're gonna have on our webpage. For example, we might have a password that will be a minimum of eight characters. We'll have name and email fields that are required. And we'll look at that while we're building the form out. So thanks for watching. Please do remember to like, subscribe, comment, get notifications and all of that jazz. And I'll see you in the next video.